Despite movies being ubiquitous, books still thrive and are relevant today, and many times readers will enjoy books more than the movie. A big reason for this is the depth of character that we experience while we're reading. Deep point of view is the current trend for books today and is likely here to stay for good. Deep point of view simply exploits the advantages books have over movies, and it's a good idea to implement this style of writing in your work. Movies and TV sometimes try to provide a sense of depth with narration, but it's never as visceral and raw as the perspective that we get in books. As a rule, I didn't dance, but it was hard to say no to Alyssa. It takes quite a bit of practice, but this video will give you an idea of how to achieve deep point of view in your manuscript. Number one, don't set the scene. The idea here is that you don't set the scene like a narrator commonly would. This kind of approach feels very once upon a time, which is as distant as you can be. Imagine a situation where our VPC, Doug, is running errands and is going through the village he lived. This is an example where it feels distancing because it's setting the scene. The village was an esoteric collection of people, the sower sowed, the baker baked, and the builder built. Each one had their special skill that they shared with the community. This doesn't sound like you're in Doug's head, it sounds like a narrator. If you're walking through your hometown, are you really thinking about each person and how they contribute to the town? The trick with deep point of view is sticking to the thoughts that only your character would realistically have, and sneaking in the details that you want. Doug minded the steps crossing the cobblestone street. He habitually focused on his boots when yeast from the bakery tickled his nose. It was best to avoid eye contact with the baker, otherwise he would harass Doug to buy bread. See how in this example it feels like you're digging into Doug's head. You can feel his thoughts much more, but simultaneously you're giving Doug's thoughts to introduce the reader to the world. The nice thing about Deep Point of View is that you don't even have to take a break in the narrative to set the scene. Instead, you fold it into the prose. Not only are you showing action, but you're also showing much more. The cobblestone street and the yeast scent adds to the scene. We are shown that Doug and the baker has this character dynamic between them, where Doug is afraid of the baker and his sales tactics. Also, to add characterization, Doug focuses on his boots. This could be a clue on Doug's lifestyle, or maybe he's incredibly pragmatic and wears boots because they're comfortable and durable. Maybe he's a blue collar worker, and this is hinting at Doug's career. This is just a segment of Doug's story. From here, you can continue to build and sneak hints at the reader. What's cool about this is that the reader will slowly learn who Doug is, but not be conscious that they're learning about Doug. Number two, write with immediacy. Basically, don't write as though the viewpoint character is ahead of what's happening in the narrative. The raccoon tried to escape Jeff, but Jeff was too quick. What happened next horrified Doug. Jeff killed the raccoon with a toothbrush. There's actually two issues here. The obvious one is what happened next horrified Doug, because this is getting ahead of the narrative. At this moment, Doug doesn't know what's going to happen next will horrify him. The other issue is not so obvious. The raccoon tried to escape. Tried is implying that the raccoon will fail to evade Jeff, but Doug doesn't know that the raccoon will successfully evade Jeff or not. In this case, Doug is getting ahead of himself by saying the raccoon tried to escape. This adds distance in the narrative. Number three, don't break the fourth wall. In books that are supposed to be deep, I still see this, which always throws me off. Whenever I see a fourth wall break in the story, it's like the character is talking to me directly and recognizes that the character is actually inside a book. This might be effective for comedic purposes, but it's awful for maintaining a sense of depth. The character might think something like, if you saw Doug, you would swear he was homeless. It's especially distancing in third person, but it's also distancing in first person. If you saw me, you would swear I was homeless. Who is you in this case? Maybe the character is saying you in a general sense, but even by doing this, you, the writer, take the risk of potentially jarring the reader out of the character's mind. Consider a safe alternative like this. If someone saw me, they would swear I was homeless. This feels deeper, like we're back in the mind of the character. It's as though the VPC isn't aware that we are in their minds. Number four, embrace the VPC's voice entirely. Don't switch to a narrator. This is usually easy to accomplish in first person because the writer is constantly reminded that they're talking from the character's point of view and not from a narrator watching the character. When you write, don't have two different voices. Have one voice, the character's voice. For example, say your VPC is a five-year-old girl. I like pizza, Jenny said, it's so cheesy. But Jenny adored pizza more than Frank Sinatra adored whiskey. The sweet and salty red sauce danced with the salty spiced pepperoni. The crunchy crust serenaded the creamy mozzarella. So this obviously changes to a narrator mode. 
Jenny is five years old. She probably doesn't know who Frank Sinatra is, and Jenny is probably incapable of describing the textures and contrasting flavors of pizza so eloquently. Her talking about the red sauce would hint that she knows what mother sauces are and is an experienced chef. The introspection sounds much more mature than Jenny really is, thus sounding like a narrator instead of Jenny's voice. In reality, all Jenny understands is that pizza tastes good, but she probably doesn't understand why pizza tastes good. You might be thinking, well this example is obviously a problem. But this example is exaggerated to show what I mean by embracing the VPC's voice. Many times, the offenders to this rule are more subtle, so it's something to keep in mind while you're writing. Number 5. Write with an inside-out perspective. When you react to something, you're usually not thinking about how your smile looks or what your body language is like. Instead, what goes through your mind are your literal thoughts, or visceral reactions that you have to things. Let's have Doug as our VPC again, and this is going to be a very distancing example. What's wrong with you? Kyle asked. Doug's cheeks reddened, his brow lined soaked with sweat as he forced a thin smile. Here we have a lot of descriptions that are coming from the outside perspective into Doug. This is very distancing because it feels like we're outside of Doug. Instead, to have a deep point of view, use introspection and inside-out reactions. What's wrong with you? Kyle asked. Forgetfulness, tardiness, and general stupidity, it was easier for Doug to answer what was right with him. The sweat on his brow stung his pores as his mind scrambled for an explanation. So here a lot more introspection is used. Doug berates and beats himself up without actually stating that Doug berates himself. Instead, the thoughts are shown instead of told. I use the sweaty brow line again, but in a different way. In the first example, saying that his brow line soaked with sweat is a visual description. However, saying that the sweat on his brow stung his pores is a sensory description from Doug. Here, he doesn't describe the sweat visually. Instead, he says how the sweat makes him feel. The second example is much deeper than the first because an inside-out perspective was used, instead of an outside-in perspective. Inversely, describing characters that are not the VPC will be outside-in perspectives. Obviously, you wouldn't use an inside-out perspective for Kyle because Kyle is not the VPC. This is also a serious writing offense of breaking the perspective, which is worse than a distant point of view. Instead, describe Kyle in a similar manner to the first example. Number 6. Limit the amount of point of views. Unless you're writing an epic, I wouldn't use any more than three point of views. Especially if the genre is horror, thriller, or mystery, then it's usually best to only stick to a single perspective anyway. Writing multiple point of views is inherently jarring for readers. They're being ripped from one mind and placed into another mind. If you must have multiple point of views, then it's best to be consistent when you alter the point of views. For example, if you have two VPCs, then consider switching the point of view with every other chapter. Don't write five chapters in one point of view and then one chapter in the other point of view. Another important factor to keep in mind when writing multiple point of views is that your voices must be unique between the point of views. If every character's voice sounds exactly the same, then the readers will either pick up on it and judge you for being lazy, or they won't pick up on it and they'll constantly get confused with whose perspective they're in. Of course, there are always exceptions. Gillian Flynn is currently my favorite author, and she does an incredible job of telling multiple point of views in dark places. However, I think it's always good to assume that you're the rule and not the exception, so a good rule to follow for depth and point of view is to limit the amount of point of views as much as possible. Number 7. Limit visceral reactions and use introspection instead. When we think in terms of deep point of view, sometimes we will use an abundance of visceral reactions. A visceral reaction is my stomach clenched or my throat dried. These are fine and can actually be effective if used sparingly, but don't over rely on these. One reason why some writers over rely on visceral reactions is because they believe that this is the best way to show emotions. Granted, visceral reactions do show emotions, but they're not even close to being the best way. For one, there's only so many ways to describe visceral reactions, and many of them are cliches. The best way to show emotions is to use introspection. Introspection are thoughts by the character that imply the emotions of the characters, but don't ever say the emotions. This is also much better than visceral reactions, because introspection can show in very nuanced and detailed ways. But visceral reactions can be very generic and vague. For example, my stomach sank is not only cliche, but it could mean multiple things. Is the VPC scared, embarrassed, or disappointed? For example, say your VPC is kissing someone she's in a relationship with, but she's unsure about her feelings. This would be a difficult way to show using visceral reactions, but to show this effectively would require introspection. 
Nothing makes sense. I want to silence him, shut him up. I hate that I do so with my lips. Before his words have a chance to escape, I capture them with a kiss, turning them into moans. This shows the VPC wrestling with their emotions using the internal thoughts of the VPC. In this example, no visceral reactions are used, nor are any emotions told outright. However, we the readers are still capable of understanding the feel of the emotions of this VPC. Number eight, don't ever hide emotions or plans from the reader, even for dramatic purposes. This is one of my biggest pet peeves in writing. I'll read a book that has a really deep point of view and the VPC will block out the reader from the emotions or thoughts, especially when it's done for dramatic purposes. For example, let's say towards the end, the VPC comes up with a plan to defeat the antagonist. However, this plan is never shared with the audience. Instead, we have to find out what the plan is while the plan is in action. This is really annoying because the VPC is intentionally blocking information that they're thinking from the audience. Since we're supposed to be inside the VPC's head, we should be able to see every thought and plan that the VPC has. To hide this information from readers for dramatic purposes is really lazy in my opinion. There's many other ways to create tense, suspenseful scenes without blocking readers. To avoid going too far off topic, some quick examples would be things like throwing a contingency into the VPC's plan, or set a time limit for the VPC to achieve their goal. Number nine, don't use any filters. When we hear filters, we usually think saw, heard, felt, etc. However, to achieve a truly deep point of view, you must go even deeper than that. Words like realized, noticed, wondered, hoped, thought, wished, for example, are also filters and should be eliminated as much as possible. Sometimes there's no other way, and you must use a filter like this, but in general, these should also be considered filters and be limited as much as possible. For example, he hopes Amber won't die on him. It's too soon for her to leave. He's not ready. Here, he hopes is distancing and should be eliminated. The fix would be something like, Amber can't die. It's too soon for her to leave. He's not ready. Notice that hope is already implied in the prose. A reader can read this and pick up that the VPC is hoping that Amber won't die. So saying he hoped is not only filtering, but it's also redundant. Consider another example where the VPC has a sudden epiphany and finds an important clue. I realize that teachers can also access the principal's office. Saying I realize is filtering from the reader and feels distancing. It's deeper if the prose is rephrased as, wait, that's right, the teachers can also access the principal's office. Notice how the fixed prose implies the epiphany moment. It implies that the VPC has realized this rather than using the filter directly to tell us that the VPC has realized this. Hey, I hope you enjoyed my video about achieving a deep sense of perspective. Feel free to ask any questions in the comments. I wanted to take a moment to let you know of my current novel. You can find the website in the description below. Also, I have a Twitter where you can ask questions, get writing tips, and be notified of upcoming videos. Thank you.